All right. Can Hi, you Keith. hear me okay? Thanks for joining us. Lauren, can you Keith, I've been thinking about you on this trip. You would have loved some of the rock climbing we've been doing. You would have felt right at home. Lauren, can you hear Janet? Lauren. Lauren, can you hear Arcus staff? Lauren, sounds like you cannot hear us for some reason. Lauren, I'm talking no, to you. No, I can't can you hear, hear you guys. Uh, turn on, okay. Turn up your volume. All right, now I can hear you guys. <laughs> Okay. It was okay. 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 Um, so we're going to get started now, and um, I will um, introduce everybody, and we'll um, just go from there. Okay. Welcome everybody to this Polar Connect event. Today is August twenty third, two thousand and eighteen. Um, we're very excited to be. Uh, basically on the side of a glacier um, with the research team in Switzerland. We're going to hear all about their um, project. And uh, as you can see, there's um, Lauren and uh, one of the research members that she'll introduce in a moment are standing by. Before we get started, I know there's people from all over that are joining us today. And we're really excited to have all the libraries in particular and school groups, since I know most of the schools also just started. Um, we have a few things uh, before we turn this over to the team. First of all, if you're joining us and have never used Adobe Connect before, the center of the screen should be where you uh, see the slides. And there's a list of participants to the left. There's a public chat area on the bottom. And this is where you can type in your questions. And if you have any troubles as you go along, please either send the host a message or just type it and we'll try to address it as we go along. This event is being ar uh, recorded and we'll share the archive with you um, through the website and out through email to everybody that registered. Um, as we started off just a little while ago, you guys were introducing yourselves in the chat area. So if you haven't done so, please let us know who you are and where you're coming from. It's a nice way for us to uh, think about who's out there in the virtual world joining us. The reason why Lauren is out um, on the side of a glacier in Switzerland is because she's part of the Polar Trek program. Um, and Polar Trek is funded by the National Science Foundation, and it's run by a nonprofit called the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, ARCUS. And we have an office in Fairbanks, Alaska, as well as in Washington, D.C. Myself and Judy, who are hosting this uh, presentation, we're located in uh, New Hampshire and Anchorage. Um, anyway, we run this program where we place teachers with researchers um, or informal educators uh, like Lauren with researchers in both the Arctic and the Antarctic regions. And the whole idea is so that they can learn uh, the science hands-on, get a good sense of what's going on with the science, and bring that back to their schools or their institutions um, um, and back to the communities that they live in. So that's Polar Trek. Um, during the presentation, again, if you have questions, the best option with this many people is to type the questions into the chat area. And as we go along, we will interrupt the uh, team as we can and have them address the questions. We'll also take questions at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Lauren to introduce her research team, and um, and we'll get started with the main presentation. And good day. OK, Lauren. OK, welcome, everybody. Um, so you're going to hear from three of the re people from the research team. Um, two of the research team already had to leave to get back uh, for the start of the semester. Um, and each one of them is going to tell them tell you a little bit about what they do and what their role in this project is. So first up is Dr. Luke Zut. Sorry, Luke Zut. <laughs> Got it. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, there, I 
uh, and I work in the geoscience department, so I work on geology. Um, I study a couple of different things, but my main uh, focus of research is looking at glaciers and specifically how they move. Uh, if you think of a glacier as a, as a big pile of ice sitting on the ground underneath, you may not realize it, but it slides over the ground just as if you put an ice cube on a board and you pick the board up uh, and slanted it, how the ice cube would slide down the board. Um, understanding how the glaciers move over that board, or move over the bed in this case, is, is really important for understanding how they, how they sort of work. Um, when the glaciers melt, they're, they're moving a lot of dirt and things around as they're active, and they leave these sort of mounds of things behind, and they erode different shapes and make all these different interesting things we call landforms. And so by looking at those landforms that are left behind, we can also begin to figure out uh, what the glaciers were doing and how they were working, um, even if there's no glaciers left at that point. Uh, and the last sort of thing I, on the slide here is, is just some different tools that I use. So um, these are field geophysics equipment. So it would mean you'd go out into the field and actually try uh, to use sort of equipment like GPR and kind of getting advanced there automatically, but <laughs> if you go back a couple of slides, uh, I've been oh. several slides. Hold on. Um, uh, do there things on the glacier to actually actually study them. One, one thing is a ground penetrating radar. It's just like the thing that senses weather, but it shoots it down through the ice to look through it. Another tool is seismics. It measures things like earthquakes and stuff. The ice actually makes little earthquakes, and we, we could record them that way. And the focus of this study is that we're using drones, so little quadcopters that we fly around and record things. So, go ahead and answer All right. slide. So I think I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this project specifically. Like I said, one of my uh, focuses of the research is understanding how glaciers slide, how they move over the, their bed. So. This uh, picture here on the right is if you were to look at a profile from a, from a glacier. So the, the horizontal line on the top would be sort of the air surface. That's where a person would, would stand. It's sort of up, up there. And if you go down towards the bottom, you're going moving through a thickness of ice until you hit sort of a layer of bedrock. If you were to drill a hole straight from the top to the bottom using uh, some sort of drilling equipment, you'd have that dashed line and it goes straight down. And if you were to wait long enough, say you waited 10 years if you, and you were standing at the top, you'd be at sort of the, the right tip of that arrow. And you can see that there's that sort of bend in the, bend in the um, ice. That's the ice deforming. But the big, can we do this? I think they're doing that. Okay, but this big sort of horizontal offset at the bottom, that represents the glacier sliding over the bed, just, just like I said, the ice cube would slide over the board if you tilted it. You can see that that makes up most of the forward motion, and that's the case for most fast-moving glaciers, is that um, most of the really important stuff ha happens right at the bottom where it slides over over, uh, over the bed. Ice moves down a hill just like a river flows, flows downhill. It's from the same basic principle. Gravity is, is pulling down the ice, pulling the ice down a slope. It just moves a lot slower. So if you were to watch a, a glacier for 100 years or so, it would move. It would look sort of like a snapshot of a river does that over a few minutes. The whole thing's kind of like also if you, this this deforming of the ice is if you took a big blob of honey and you put it on a board and you waited, you'd see the honey sort of deform and ooze down the board. Ice oozes like that, but it also slides. So there's these two things combined. Um, you can next one. go ahead to the next slide. Yep. So since, since this sliding at the, at the bottom of the glacier is so important, uh, or it contributes so much to the forward motion of the glacier, it, it's really important uh, for predicting things like sea level rise. And the reason for that is if the glaciers slide a lot faster, if the ice moves a lot faster, then a lot more ice is just simply conveyed, moved, and dumped into the ocean. These glaciers we look at here, they don't, they don't slide and and end at the ocean. They sort of end and they melt. But a lot of big glaciers like Antarctica and in Greenland and some glaciers in Alaska and things like that, they actually end at the ocean. And so how they get rid of most of their ice is just by dumping it into the ocean. So if, they, if those glaciers are moving a lot faster, they're just dumping a lot more material into the ocean, which can contribute to sea level rise. So in order to be able to accurately predict how much sea level is going to go up, we have to be able to understand how fast the glacier is going and since the most important thing for understanding how fast the glacier is going is how it's sliding, we need a good way to estimate how fast it's 
been applied. And ultimately, that's what we're doing out here is understanding, uh, trying to get a better grip on being able to predict how fast that sliding occurs at the base. All right. Play. I think there's one more. Yep. Yeah, so to, to try to get at this aspect of sliding, this, that's what the, the main goal of this project is as three phases. The first phase is what you're seeing right now is we're out in the field making measurements. One important thing is is what the, the bed looks like that the glacier's sliding over. Is it really bumpy? Is it flat? Does it have bumps that look like a staircase? Does it have smooth rolling bumps? All of those things are really important in being able to predict how the glacier slides. And so we could we could make up beds, which is most of the time what is done, and just sort of uh, make educated guesses as to how the ice would slide over a bed of that sort of shape. But we've taken a different approach, and what we've done is come out here into the field and come to these areas where the glaciers were sliding over the rocks but have since melt, melted back, and we're using drones to map the rocks. And we, we fly the drones over the rocks, and we use these surveying equipment, and with the combination of those two things, we can build really accurate models of what the bed looks like. Uh, they're called digital elevation models. Um, it's something like every five, or no, it's be less, every four inches we get one data point by flying these drones over and over and over. The second phase of the, the, exper of the entire project is these laboratory experiments. And so at Iowa State University, which is uh, the other university affiliated with the project, they have this large machine in a, in a giant walk-in freezer, sort of like a freezer you'd find behind a McDonald's or something, where a one-meter disk of ice is spun over a bed. So it's just like how the glacier is sliding over the bed. And inside the ice, they put little pieces of debris. And what we're trying to figure out is how that debris or dirt that's in the ice affects the sliding of the glacier uh, over time. The last part of this problem is where all these pieces get put together. And this is in the numerical modeling. So you build a model of the whole glacier sliding in a computer. So we take the part from the field where we figure out what the bed looks like, and we make a simpler version of it. And we take the relationship from the experiment where we figure out how the debris at the bottom affects the sliding, and we put them together into this numeric model that, in the end, hopefully can predict how sliding occurs and will produce one of these so-called sliding laws, which is the ultimate objective of the, prob of the project. All right. Is that it? Uh, yep. Okay. Jake, I think. Um, we have sure, a question. Go ahead. Um, DJ would like to know: um, Do you use drone deploy to analyze the feed from the drone? We we actually use a different program that's called uh, Drones Made Easy. And why we use that is we pre-program in the entire grid, and it uploads it to the drone, and then we just push go, and the drone flies whatever pattern we pre-program into it. And a lot of times these patterns take several batteries. So they might take like, in, in this instance, we brought 15 drone batteries into the field with us. And so it'll fly part of the grid until the battery's done. It'll come back to where we are. It lands. We swap the battery up. It starts out. It goes back to where it left off, and it keeps flying and does this over and over. So every day we collect approximately four hours or five hours of drone flying time and something like 100 gigabytes of images of, of the floor field. So we use this other program called MapMade Easy, and then we just we use uh, DGI Phantom 4 Advanced Drones, and that comes with a, a set software that we can use to fly the drone around manually if we want to. But most of the time, again, is spent with this sort of pr uh, automated program that flies it for us. OK, so next up I have uh, Jacob. He's going to talk about what his role in this project is. Uh, hi, so I'm Luke's PhD student, so I'm from University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and I'm interested in the same sort of things that, that Luke is, uh, basically understanding how a glacier slides over its bed uh, and using a bunch of different uh, geophysical tools to do that. Um, specifically for my master's project was, was also with Luke. I used ground penetrating radar to study drumlins, which are these glacial mounds that form under the ice. Uh, as ice flows over it, uh, and by looking at the internal structure of these mounds, 
were able to better understand what sort of forces were acting on the dirt to form these mounds and therefore understand what was going on at the bed of the ice uh, and what kind of mechanics were going on as it was sliding. See the next one? Yeah. I can see. So for this project, um, I'm predominantly in charge of the drone flying and producing things called digital elevation models, which basically show you it's a digital representation of what the four field actually looks like, how its elevation uh, varies with really high resolution. Uh, this image that you have in front of you is from uh, Castle Guard, Alberta, uh, in Canada. Uh, and this was at five centimeter resolution. Uh, so basically, each pixel of this DEM digital elevation model represents five centimeters, which is uh, extremely high resolution. Usually, these run about 20 meters. is pretty standard for stuff that you can find. Uh, and so we're interested in this so that we can be able to represent how statistically represent these four fields and be able to show, give that to the modeler um, and say, OK, this whole entire four field has these sort of parameters that we're interested in, such as slope, uh, certain shapes of the bumps. Uh, we're interested in all of these, just the morphology of the four field. And we try to find a representative spot within that four field, kind of shrink it down uh, so that the computer doesn't crash immediately. So we find try to find a smaller representative representative area of the spore field, give it to the modeler, and he can show through his program how the ice would behave over certain morphology that are representative uh, in this digital elevation model. Great. All right. Thanks, Jacob. Um, yes. We had we had a question there, but in the in the last in the last slide, it, somebody wanted to know if that was Jacob, but it <laughs> yeah, is. That is Jacob. Um, I think they just. <laughs> That's uh, when yeah. you're in Canada, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's when they were taking the data for that map okay. that we showed okay. you. Um, so up next, I have Christian, and he is our computer modeler for this project. <clears throat> so hello, everyone. My name is Christian, and uh, I'm the numerical modeler. Here I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Iowa State University, and my background is mainly in mathematics and uh, geosciences. Uh, during my PhD, I used numerical models mostly to look at different numerical formulations and mathematical formulations of how glaciers slide. Uh, and uh, I was also fortunate enough to be out in the field quite a bit, so I did radar surveys of ice thickness in Greenland and in northern Sweden as well. For this particular project, I'm. Uh, Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, okay. sure. For this project, uh, it looks like my slide is a bit uh, warped, uh, I would say. <laughs> yeah. <that's> but right. <laughs> anyways, for this, for, this, for this project, I'm 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 uh, building a numerical model that, just as Luke and Jake said, uh, is supposed to relate how fast the gl glacier slides over different uh, surfaces. And, and so I'm going to use, in the end, the uh, DEMs that they use the drones for to construct uh, so I can relate, uh, dr basically, drag at the bed to how fast the glacier slides. So if you imagine, basically, just like water, if you have an, any sort of object, like a sphere or a, or, or a uh, cube or something like that, and water flow, flowing around it, uh, this object will exert a, a certain drag on the fluid, or the fluid exerts a drag on the object. Depending on what type of object it is, how, how it's shaped, it will exert more or less drag. Uh, and it's basically the same thing for glacier sliding. So at the bed, depending on how the bottom topography is, uh, different drag will be exerted on the glacier and resist how the glacier flows. Uh, so this, in the end, we will be able to look at these different real elevation models and see how glaciers, how, how the shear stresses at the bed relate to the velocity that glacier slides with. Good job. Awesome. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? <laughs> um, okay. So our other...
Okay. No, not <laughs> I, yet. It's very bright here, so we have a hard time seeing the screen. Um, so our other two team members, the ones that just left this past Monday, are Anna Thompson. Uh, she's a graduate student at Iowa State University. She is actually the one that is using that uh, machine in the walk-in freezer that Luke was talking about and doing the experiments um, with the ring of ice and uh, the, you know, measuring the forces um, as debris as the ice flows over debris. And then Dr. Neil Iverson, um, he is um, Anna's uh, advisor for her master's project. Um, and yes, he works with all that stuff too. So <laughs> we're sorry that they had to leave early. Um, otherwise, they would have been here to say hello themselves too. Um, so they've already mentioned the field site in Canada. Um, that was what they did last summer. You can see some pictures of the setup. Um, they only did one four field there. They had a different setup, different type of equipment that was much more cumbersome um, and took, what, five days, to, five days to do one four field, whereas here we're doing one four field um, in a matter of hours. Um, and they were also camping <laughs> in this uh, trip, which we were not camping in this one. Um, so yes, they're very happy with the upgrade in the, <laughs> the method. Um, so where are we in Switzerland? So if you look at this map, um, you can see where Switzerland is uh, outlined in yellow. Uh, you can see like Italy and France surrounding it. So the orange square in the center is where I'm going to zoom in and show you uh, where we've been working. <clears throat> so here are some of the field sites. Uh, and you can see the different stars indicating the different uh, glacial fields. Um, so we've been kind of all up and down this valley, um, some that are closer to Italy, some that are closer to France. Um, so the first one we went to was San Florin. I'll show you guys some pictures of some of these ones. Um, the Triant Glacier is one we went to when it started pouring. Um, we actually weren't able to uh, measure the four field there because we couldn't get we couldn't safely get across the river there. Uh, the Rhone Glacier is where we are today, and they just measured that this morning. Uh, the Lang Glacier, they were there twice, because uh, there's two, four fields in, uh, at the Lang site. Um, Wildhorn is another one. Alesh, uh, we haven't measured that one yet, but we did go up to view it from uh, the mountaintop. Um, that's one that we might get to in the next couple days. The Alalin is where we were yesterday, right? Yeah, that's where we were yesterday. Um, and that one was very tough for field to walk, <laughs> to walk up and down. Um, and then the short work, which is also near the Alalin. OK, so <clears throat> the flora and fauna. So what have we been seeing out in the field besides glaciers and lots of rocks? Um, so <clears throat> we haven't seen a lot of large animals, although after I put this slide together, um, some of the, the group actually saw some ibex up on top of the glacial floor field. Um, but before that, most of the time, we've been seeing lots of livestock, like cows and sheep. Um, you can see <laughs> some of the pictures there, lots of cows with the Swiss cowbells around their neck. Um, other than that, uh, we've been seeing a lot of insects, especially a lot of bees and um, yellow jackets and things like that. Uh, they're everywhere, um, mostly because of the next things on the pictures. There's the wildflowers everywhere. Um, I mean, I've lost track of how many different, yes, the pollinators. They're doing their job out here. Um, so <laughs> I've lost track of how many different types of flowers I've seen. Um, Lots of them, they're beautiful. You can see pictures of just some of them. Um, but I was really excited because I finally saw Edelweiss yesterday. <laughs> so that made, that made my trip. I've been looking for it the whole time. Um, OK, so what's the weather been like? Um, well, it's <laughs> very different depending on where we are. Um, so not only for altitude, um, but also you know, during the time of day. So if we're up in higher altitudes, or like today when we were on the ice, it's pretty cold. And with the wind, it can be chilly. Um, and we've had a lot of afternoon thunderstorms. We've been pretty lucky. 
uh, when we've been out in the field that we haven't gotten rained out too much um, because the drone cannot fly at all if it rains. Um, um, but it has also been quite hot here in Switzerland during the day, um, which has made some of the field work super fun, climbing up and down these uh, four fields. So uh, part of the reason why it's been so hot is that Europe um, has been experiencing a heat wave this summer. And when I've been talking to a lot of the local people that live you know, either here in Switzerland or in other places of Europe, they were all telling me the same thing about the heat. Um, when I was, in, I was staying in Grindelwald, and my host there was telling me that the temperatures they were experiencing there were as hot as what the hottest place in um, uh, Switzerland is. So that was very unusual. So uh, you know, if you look at this map, you can see Switzerland's right in the middle of all these red dots. Um, so it's been way hotter than, um, <laughs> than expected. We were expecting much cooler temperatures. OK, so a typical day in the field. Um, when we wake up early, we have to load up all of our gear. Um, we have to plan on being out in the field for the whole day. So this means bringing our water and uh, some change of clothes. We usually bring um, rain gear. Uh, see, I'm wearing my vest today. This is maybe one of the only days I've actually worn it because it's been pretty hot. Um, and we have to bring our lunches in the field as well. And then the <clears throat> then we'd have to drive to the site. So we are, like I mentioned, we are not camping right now. We are actually staying in houses, uh, different homes in Switzerland. Um, and they were picked because each of those houses is about an hour to maybe an hour and a half away from the various four fields that we were trying to get to. So after we would load up all of our equipment, we'd get in the cars. Um, and drive you know, an hour to 90 minutes to where we would be um, trying to get to the forefield. So uh, the earlier sites that we went to, once we got there, we had um, some pretty significant hikes to get into where the forefield is. Um, so some of the hikes have been close to two hours trying to get in. Um, some of the hikes have been brutal in altitude changes, um, up to you know, 3,000 feet in altitude changes, um, some a little more gradual than others. There have been some that have been very, very tough. Um, but anyway, so once we get up to the four field, <laughs> um, we'd have to set up the equipment. So if you look at the bottom left hand of the screen, you can see the team is setting up a tripod, uh, which would have um, a unit on the top of it, RTK, is that what it's called? So it's, it's, it's called RTK, but it's a very expensive GPS <laughs> that would be on the top of it. Um, and that kind of acts as our base station, um, which is collecting um, you know, GPS data. Um, and then I don't think there's a picture of the drone in that picture. I, I do have some other ones. So you met Jake. He's our drone flyer. He would set up the drone and make sure that the um, area was set. And uh, so while he was setting up the drone, the rest of us would split up into teams. We'd have to go put targets um, or markers in the field. Um, so yes, you can see that picture right there with the arrow next to it. Um, it's just a flat piece of plastic. They're actually um, bases from you know baseball <laughs> that have been painted with red spray paint so that it, they're visible from the pictures from the drone. Um, so in order to get, we don't just place the markers anywhere. Uh, the night before, uh, Luke would uh, look at uh, Google Earth and pick various locations in the four field and mark them with their coordinates and plug those into GPS, handheld GPS devices. So then we'd have to go find those places in the four field. So that middle picture on the bottom, um, I can't tell who that is, if that's me or someone else. Um, where we're using the GPS, handheld GPS, to navigate to uh, the place where we're pu uh, putting the markers. So usually we'd have between, what, 8 and 15? Normally 15. Yeah, about 15 markers um, out in the field that have to be placed. Um, let me see what my next slide is. Oh. So um, 
the next step, so as J uh, Jake is flying the drone and collecting all that data, the other team would have to go and do a survey. So go around with another uh, GPS unit that is very precise, and you have to collect um, GPS data from each of those markers. Because um, once they have that GPS data, it will be, um, what do you say, integrated with the drone data when it gets to um, the point where they're going to be making the models. So what is a four field? I keep saying this word. Um, and I have to thank Julie. I forgot to put her name on this. But uh, Julie at the Geology Museum made this figure on the bottom for me. <laughs> so thanks, Julie. Um, but if you look at the top, you can see the pictures. Um, I can only see the one on the, the right-hand side of the glare. But the one on the right, you can see the blob of the glacier at the top. And then you can see that there is um, a stretch of rock in front of it. Okay. Um, so the diagram that's at the bottom, the terminal moraine, or the moraine, this, so glaciers act as a bulldozer. And when they advance or you know, move forward, they push everything along its path. And as it gets bigger and bigger, it's going to push a pile of sediment at the front of the glacier. And when it gets to its biggest extent, you know, that's going to be how far it travels. And then when it starts to uh, recede or melt, okay, it's going to drop that pile, which is that labeled as terminal moraine there, at its um, biggest extent of the glacier. So what you have between where the glacier currently is and that mark is what we call the glacial forefield. And so that part right there is what they're trying to get the high resolution images of with this um, drone procedure that, we, that they, they explained to you earlier. OK, so here are some more pictures of some of these field measurements. Um, in the top left, you can see Jake flying the drone. OK, and like you said, it takes a couple hours of flying to get um, all these measurements. And usually, he would fly the drone twice in the pattern that he had set out, um, once with the camera facing straight down, and then once with the camera um, oblique or at an angle. So that way, if there's um, a lot of release, that might be in shadow. If you're looking with the camera straight down, that you'll be able to image all of those things. Um, the one at the top right, that is, again, that um, highly precise GPS unit that's collecting data. Um, and then while there are some other measurements that need to be taken, so we also pair, uh, they pair the measurements from, uh, or sorry, the model with real measurements of glacial striations. So striations are grooves in the rock that are made as the ice flows over the surface. Um, so if you read my journals, I compared this to if you were to pull a heavy piece of furniture, drag it over a wood floor, and it leaves deep gouges in the wood floor. Um, the, that's pretty much how striations are made, except that the wood floor is the bedrock and the heavy furniture is the glacier. Um, so the direction that the striations or those grooves are pointing in tells us information about which way the glacier um, was uh, flowing in the past. So we have to go out and measure the direction of these striations because we want to include um, the data of where, which way the glacier was flowing in these models as well. And then I think that bottom right hand is me looking at the GPS, trying to figure out how to get to the next um, marker point. OK, so um, here's just some pictures showing of some of the places we've been. Uh, we have been to two other places since these, um, but I couldn't get them into the presentation in time. So the top one is the San Florin. Um, this was the largest four field that we measured. Um, it actually took two days to map the, like, the upper and lower parts of this um, four field. Um, you can see there was a lot of relief, a lot of you know, ups and downs. So you can see a little tiny pond collecting from some of the snow melt. There were some awesome uh, wildflowers there. And you can see we're um, hiking across some of the snow that is still in place that hasn't melted yet. 
Um, so the bottom three images, that's from Triant. That's the one that we couldn't do the measurements on the four field um, because the stream was just uh, running too swiftly. Um, and some of, some of the runoff from these uh, glacial meltwaters is extremely fast, and it's just not a good idea to cross it in some places. And this is just one place that we couldn't find a place for all of us to cross. Um, so the middle picture, so the, I'm sorry, the one on the left, you can see the glacier up in the corner. The one in the middle, that's a picture from the hut. Um, usually a lot of these glaciers have a hut, which is just a small place where you can buy <laughs> food or drink and sit, you know, along your hike. Um, that's just the view. They had a nice little zen garden outside the hut. You can see the glacier in the background. Um, and then the last one, you can see all of us taking a break, eating lunch <laughs> along the path. So, um, OK, so the next one's the wild horn. Um, this is the hike that almost broke me. <laughs> it was a very, very tough hike up. Um, when I got to the top, I pretty much collapsed on the, <laughs> on the ground because it was very hard. It was over 3,000 feet of relief. Um, but once you got there, it was beautiful. Um, uh, and, you know, getting around the four field was difficult, too. It was, there was a lot of ups and downs. Um, I found this hike, you know, even down pretty hard because a lot of um, what we walked along was unconsolidated rock. So it made your footing pretty <laughs> treacherous going down. Um, OK, then the bottom one is Lang, which uh, was my favorite four field. Uh, I just thought it was very scenic. Um, and so the other four fields, a lot of them, they, the bedrock was actually made of sedimentary limestone. Um, so by the time we got to Lang, I think we were all tired of looking at gray rock. <laughs> so when we went to Lang, it was the uh, first time we were seeing a lot of um, metamorphic rock as the bedrock. Um, and I love looking at the rocks along the trail. So there were a lot of really cool and pretty and shiny rocks to look at. Uh, you can see some of the hike on the way in on the bottom left. Um, the middle one, you can see uh, the glacier up in the center. And then the one on the right, you can see kind of all of us uh, sitting on the fore field, kind of planning what's the, how we're going to be <laughs> tackling this fore field. Um, so some other things that we're, we saw lots of evidence of glacial erosion. Um, so like I told you already, a glacier it acts as a big bulldozer, but not only does it push sediments around over it, but it also tends to smooth out the rocks. So if you look at the top one, you can see the, the surface is really smooth. Um, and you can also see some striations. I know in that picture you can see the white. The white lines are actually not the striations. Um, those are a, diff that's a precipitate, different type of rock. So in that top picture, the striations are actually running from left to right. Um, and then in the bottom, there's this thing that I hadn't learned about. This is something new that I learned um, on this trip. It's a calcite precipitate. So this forms on, um, with glaciers go over limestone bedrock. So this is essentially the same process that forms um, stalactites and stalagmites in caves. So the water that flows over it um, will dissolve part of the limestone. And then as that water is flowing underneath the glacier, it will actually redeposit that um, dissolved limestone in another place. And it redeposits it where the glacier comes in contact with the bedrock. So this um, calcite precipitate was a big indicator for Anna. She was looking for this all over the field um, to make measurements to see where the ice came back in contact with the, the rock. Um, so some other signs of glacial erosion. Um, the top picture, you can see it's a nice U-shaped valley. Um, so if you look kind of like from one side to the other side of the valley, you can see it kind of makes this nice shape like the letter U. And that is very um, typical of um, a glacier when it moves through a valley. It, it makes that U shape. Um, and then on the bottom, 
is a terminal moraine. I've kind of outlined it in red for you because it's hard to see. Um, but if you look right above where that red line is, there's a little like kind of darker black indicator. That's actually like the top of the ridge. So you can imagine that when um, during a, a colder period of time, a glacier would fit right into that little horseshoe-shaped part. Okay, and the um, that horseshoe shape is the pile of sediment that's been pushed at the front of the glacier. So that was a, a real good example we saw. Let's see. Um, so the team has kind of already talked about what they do with this data that I've collected by the drone. So here I have a screenshot of just a test surface that they put together um, using the pictures. And this, this one, uh, one surface that you see um, has about one million data points in it, and it took the computer about a day to generate in it, and it took the computer about a day to generate it. Um, so, um, so, oh yeah, someone's got a mute there. Or whoever called in on the phone, can you please mute your phone? Yeah. The 917 area code. Yeah. All right. I guess I'll just. All right. I'll just. Okay. So this is a low resolution, even though it's a million data points. But when they get back to the university, to the lab, and they put the full resolution of this um, data into the computer, um, it will end up having about 10 million data points. Um, and it will take the computer several days to generate that, um, that, that surface. So you know, if you look at this, it's, you, know, you can see that it's 3D and that it's still pretty um, high resolution. It will be even better once they get back to the lab and have time to generate it. Um, so another thing that is just everywhere we go is climate change. Um, so a lot of these glaciers have historic photos showing what the glacier looked like in the past and what it looks like today. So you can see these pictures from um, Triant Glacier showing in 1891 and then 2009, um, and that there has been significant recession in that time. Um, the graph on the other side is a picture I took from the top of Jungfraunhoek. It's the um, highest uh, train station in Europe. Um, and they actually have a climate uh, station there that's collecting data on climate. And I thought it was very interesting. If you look at the um, right side of the graph, you can see it's basically all red. And what that is showing is air surface, um, uh, sorry, air temperature okay, and above average. And so basically the last, I can't see what year that is, but since about 2000, every year the, the temperature has been above the average. There has been very, very few years that have been below the average temperature. So, um, you know, Europeans and things that we've seen here in Switzerland are very aware of these changes. Um, and <laughs> It was everywhere. It was in our face, all these, these changes. Um, OK, so that's all I have. <laughs> and it's time for questions. Yeah. Oh, actually, we can, do you guys want to see what's around the corner? <laughs> yeah. OK. Yeah, that would so be great. We didn't do the presentation over there because it's pretty windy. But like I said, we're at the, the Rhone Glacier. All right. It gets loud from the wind. How I apologize. OK. So that's the Rhone Glacier. Can you guys see it? And then at the foot, you can see there is a lake Okay, that is actually from the meltwater coming off the glacier. And if you look to the right, it's actually an interesting feature. Um, there's actually tarps covering the glacier in that area right there. 
And that is actually, you know, humans attempt to keep the glacier from melting. Um, and in that part under the tarp, there's actually um, an ice tunnel. So it's sort of working, but we walked through there this morning, and there's still a lot of melting occurring there. So it's, it's not a long-term solution. It's only a temporary, you know, <laughs> keeping the dam from bursting. So yes, there's the Rome Glacier again, and the lake there. And all those rocks that you can see, that big, like, hill, that's the core field that they were measuring today. So, all right, I'll go back out of the wind so you, you can hear us better. All right. I guess we can... Wow, that was cool. Okay, for questions, I guess. And Luke, you have to join you. Help us answer. Yeah, um, I have a bunch that came up earlier, so I'll just go through them real quick. Uh, Louise Huffman, she wanted to know, is the sliding motion different from the dynamics of the honey analogy oozing movement? In other words, is sliding a specific term for a, spo for a specific moment? Yeah, movement? It, it specifically refers to uh, the that. ice right at the bottom. So the honey part where the honey is moving, that's the ice deforming. So that's 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 the uh, the ice can act, even though you look at the ice and you think, oh, that's really solid. If you looked at it for a long enough time, it begins to behave like a fluid, like a honey or something like that. It's, it's more, uh, you could, <laughs> a better analogy might be if you took a board and you rubbed Vaseline all over it and then you put honey on top of the Vaseline, the honey would deform, but it would also slip down the Vaseline. And that slipping over the Vaseline is the, is the sliding part. It's, it's the part right where the ice sits on the thing underneath it, and it moves over that thing underneath it. It only is at, right at the bottom. It, it, it's important. Whereas the honey is throughout the entire glacier, or almost the entire glacier, is it, it's deforming like that. Okay. Um, another question from Karen. How do you locate the glacier? Um, well, the, for, the, for this specific project, there was, it was sort of a two-part thing. One was that, uh, so Neil Iverson, the, the uh, other PI on the project, he had actually been out here for a project uh, in, I think, like 2010, where they was, the, the objective of it was completely different, but he still needed to go to glaciers where he could see the four fields, where there wasn't a bunch of debris and things on top of it. And so he had been out here before and identified a, a bunch of them that way. And we've added a couple more that they didn't go to in 2010. And basically how we did it was look at Google Earth. It's got really good imagery. And so we can, so we can pretty well identify rocks that are exposed in front of the glaciers where there's not a lot of debris on it. Because the really important thing is that there's not a lot of sort of dirt on top of the rocks. We need sort of clean rocks that are exposed that we can see with the that we can see with the drone. And we also don't want plants, so we got to look for areas where there's not a lot of plants out in front. Luckily, in four fields and in, in glaciers, especially ones that have been recently sort of um, exposed, where the ice has recently retreated, there's not a lot of plants normally. And so the main thing we're looking for is, is there is there a lot of debris or is there not a lot of debris? And that's what we use Google Earth for. Okay, cool. Great answer. Um, next question is from DJ. She wanted to know how is Lauren's ankle? <laughs> I'm walking on it, so that's okay. <laughs> it's a little swollen, but I'll survive. <laughs> Thanks, DJ. Thanks for your concern. <laughs> All right. From the EB Library, uh, kids in East Brunswick want to know what are your accommodations are and are you camping? Yeah. They miss so your we are staying picture. in some rented homes. So we actually have pretty luxurious accommodations compared to what they had last summer when they were in Canada. Um, so you know we have rooms to ourselves at this point and a kitchen and you know, showers and washer and dryer, so we, we've got it all. Um, but if you want to say about camping, your camping experience last year. Yeah, so last year, which was still part of the same project, it was just in a different spot, uh, we we 
camped in a, a high elevation meadow, actually, so there was no trees or anything around. And, and how we got there was a helicopter flew all of our gear in, all of the camping equipment and all of the, um, the scientific equipment, and then the uh, four of us walked up to the up to the floor field. So we walked about 12 miles uh, up up a glacier was a big part of it, and then we climbed up a big ridge to get to this meadow that we stayed in. And it was very basic. We had we had sort of camping tents that you might use in a campground, but a little bit more sturdy, a Coleman stove like you would use at a campground. And almost all of our food was just cans of stuff that we poured in a pot and heated up. So it wasn't it wasn't real extravagant, but it it was good after you had been hiking all day. And last year it was actually very cold in Canada, so anything that was warm when you got back was was a welcome treat. <laughs> yeah. So there's the picture of. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> So there was a question about um, what are the temperatures you are experiencing? Um, so it's been a range. Um, there have def definitely been days where it's been almost up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but when I was, I think the lowest temperature is maybe around 30 degrees Fahrenheit, but average maybe 60 to 70 degrees, um, which seems pleasant, but when you're hiking, up and down all day, you tend to get quite sweaty and even 60 degree temperatures. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, from Regina, she wanted to say thank you for the clear explanations and examples of using mathematical models in science. This will be used in NGSS training. Some still think of 3D representations when they hear the word model. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a question, There's just that, a that comment. That's three-dimensional thinking, right, with science and math, so, and engineering, too, because we've got the drones and things here. So, yes, there's, there's a lot to be, a lot, of, a lot of NGSS lessons to be learned from this project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Mary Ann, uh, why do you hike so much? Well, there really isn't much of a choice to get to the four fields unless you hike in. Um, so it's been kind of a treat the last two days that we've been able to park right next to the four fields. We haven't had to have long hikes in, but the trek up and down the four field has been um, quite extensive. So according to my Fitbit yesterday, even though we could see our car from the four field the entire time we were in the field, we still walked over six miles up and down, just straight up and straight down, hiking up and down these um, uh, rocks, and it was, a, it was over a hundred floors of climbing up and down. So even when we have short hikes, it's still a lot of physical, <laughs> a lot of physical exertion. Yeah, and the big thing is, we remember, we have to get to the rocks that don't have any debris on them, don't have any dirt on them, and those tend to be closer to the glacier. And uh, in the last 100 years, the glaciers have retreated quite a bit. For example, the Rhone Glacier that Lauren just showed you, uh, the sign said it uh, retreated a kilometer in just the last 80 years. And so if we had been here 80 years ago, we would have had not had to hike at all. We could have just walked right onto it. And that's the case with a lot of these is, now the glaciers retreated the ways, and the area in front is starting to sort of weather, and debris is building up, and things like that. So we have to go further and further to get to the spots that um, is good for the survey that we need to do. <laughs> um, all right, Marianne said thank you. Chico uh, Junior High is signing Hi. off, and uh, she said best wishes, good quad workouts for all of you. So thank you for joining. Um, so from uh, Peter in Madison, New Jersey, he wants to know, can you talk about the time scales over which the four fields That's a really have good formed? question and a hard one to answer. We don't actually have very good uh, estimations of the rates at which subglacial erosion takes place because you can imagine that before the glacier ever got here, these areas might have been relatively flat, and it's only from the glacier going over and over and over it for thousands and thousands of years, or in some cases in Antarctica millions of years, 
that landforms like this uh, develop. And so it probably takes something on the order of tens of thousands of years, but it's, it's, it depends a lot on what the rock's made up of. If it's a rock that's really um, weak, it can break up really quickly, and things like this can develop really fast. But if it's a rock that's really strong, like the rocks behind us are granite, um, they might take a long time. So one thing that we're seeing is we done we the big reason we've done all these four fields is because they all have different types of rocks in them. Some are really strong and some are really weak. And one thing we're trying to figure out is what do the really strong rocks look like versus what do the really weak rocks look like. And the part of that is that one might take a lot longer to form than the other, and one might make one probably does make different shapes than the other. We'll be able to analyze that sort of in the years to come with the data set we've been collecting. Okay, thanks. Um, Margie would like to know, can you say something about systematic differences between Swiss glaciers, Alaskan glaciers, and Patagonia um, glaciers? That's a tough question. <laughs> not really. <laughs> yeah, those are all of those regions have what uh, we call valley glaciers. So um, the big distinction we make with respect to glaciers are valley glaciers, which are glaciers that occupy a valley and the sides are made up of rocks. Ice caps, which are bigger, uh, but not enormous. There's ice caps in places like no way northern Canada and Iceland. And then the biggest scale is ice sheets. So ice sheets, there's, only, there's two right now, Greenland and uh, the Antarctic ice sheet. There is, back in time, 20,000 years ago, there was another ice sheet over North America called the Laurentide ice sheet. There's an ice sheet over uh, Europe, things like that. So those have, those have since gone away until we're left with these two large ice sheets. With respect to um, how the valley glaciers respond between those three different locales, in a lot of respects, they're probably they're probably pretty similar. Uh, there's different weather patterns there that affect them in different ways, um, but the mechanics of how they work in uh, the Swiss Alps is the same as how they work in Patagonia, is the same as how they work in Alaska, is the same as how they work in Greenland. So that's why if we can figure out what's going on here, we'll have a pretty good grasp for all these other areas that have glaciers too, because the basic mechanics are, are the same from all, one place to another. Oh, thank you, Karen. I'm glad that you like my journals. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Marge uh, also wants to know, do these glaciers ever calve, or are they just steady melting and sliding? So, uh, all of the glaciers we've been to so far are just steady sliding and melting with the exception of the Rhone Glacier that you saw today. And that's because the Rhone Glacier drains into a, a big mm -hmm. proglacial lake that Lauren showed you. And you can actually see there's yeah. there's icebergs floating around in the lake that are you know the size of a house. Um, so this one does this one does calve. It's not huge calving events like you might see in Alaska or Antarctica, but it is it is calving icebergs off. Um, okay, from the Spotswood Public Library, how much longer will you be in Switzerland, and have you com have you almost completed uh, so your survey? We are. We actually have to drive back to um, Zurich to catch our flights on Monday. So we have three more field days, um, and two two potential gla uh, glacial four fields that we're going to try to do in that time. Um, but there were seven that seven glacier floor fields that were the main objective for these. And if we could get any others, that would be great. And they, today, the Rhone was the last one. So they have finished those, set, those main seven ones. Um, and we'll, hopefully, the weather continues to hold out so we can maybe get one or two of the other ones. And Maggie, Maggie says that right. asked how heavy the equipment was. Um, <laughs> Heavy, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, if you look at my journals, I tried to post pictures of us with the packs on our back. Um, and <clears throat> they're pretty big packs. I haven't weighed them, but I know they felt a lot heavier when I first started doing these hikes than they do now. I feel like they've just kind of become, part, well, at least mine has become part of my back at this point. Um, but it still is pretty heavy. I don't know. I'm going to put a pound on I'd say the the lighter packs, 
that's what I'm carrying. It's probably about 30 pounds, and the heavier ones are probably about 40 pounds, would be my guess. Yeah. yeah. So it's like hiking all, up 3,000 feet with a small child on your back. <laughs> you guys are going to be in serious shape. You've got to find some... Uh, I don't know, some extreme event that you can all go participate in. No, I think be everyone's shaking <laughs> their heads laughing. Great. I don't think that's... <laughs> they all, we all have plans for the opposite <laughs> after this, so... Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, so, Rhea uh, Starker wants to say, my mom says hi to Lauren, hi, and she wants to know, did you see any snakes? <laughs> did you see any snakes? I didn't, but they did. We did see one snake. Um, I don't know snakes I don't know it was a, it was about two feet long or a foot and a half long and it, it just ran away it didn't look too threatening but we did see one yeah I've also seen a couple um, lizard like things I again I don't know anything about lizards but I've seen a couple of them um, running across the trail as we've been hiking hiking through <laughs> Uh, let's see, Rashimi would like to know, did you collect rock samples from the glacier site? So, um, many of us were collecting them for our own personal reasons, but we weren't collecting any rocks um, for, like, testing purposes. So, there, many of us came down the trail with our pockets um, filled with various rock types. I know I had, my pants were slightly heavier <laughs> on my way trips down filled with different metamorphic rocks, with ones with mica in it. Um, Christian found a really nice piece of alpine quartz. Um, this area is well known for its alpine quartz, so um, we, we have found those. <laughs> and yes, Karen, I do have Polar Shrek Poppy with me. She's in my backpack right now. So <laughs> Polar Shrek Poppy is my little uh, Arctic photographer Lego person that I've been taking pictures <laughs> of at various places throughout the field. <clears throat> All right. Well, we want to, um, we came up on top of our hour here, and we had lots of great questions. So if you weren't able to ask your question uh, right now, be sure to post them on the, uh, with the Lauren's journals on ask your questions there and she can respond to them. Great presentation and thank you so much research team for letting us see the Rhone Glacier. That was uh, a nice treat as well. Yeah, we were trying, we were panicking about whether the internet would work but, to show the glacier but we're glad that <laughs> that worked out. <laughs> yeah, no that was really nice and uh, we hope that uh, your ankle recovers and that you're able to enjoy the last little bit in Switzerland and like uh, the, the uh, museum all said that you have been having great journals and they're really informative so thanks very much for putting your heart into this and uh, and doing a great presentation and thanks to everybody joining us um, from all across the uh, the world there it was really nice to have you all on thanks this everyone morning. thank you all right. Hi. Well, with that, we're going to say goodbye, and I'm going to stop the recording.